Allison Vaughn. She is an entrepreneur, community advocate, public speaker, speaker, and writer. Allison Vaughn is founder and CEO of Jackets for Jobs Incorporated, a nonprofit that has provided employment, etiquette, career skills, training, and professional attire to 20,000 job seekers since 2000. In 2013, Jackets for Jobs opened an office in Botswana, Africa. Vaughn represented the organization on the NASDAQ floor where she rang the closing bell in 06 and 2014. Vaughn is a Goldman Sachs scholar, a graduate of the investment firm's 10,000 small business or small businesses program. She is one of Martha Stewart's dreamers into doers, a group of entrepreneurs who turn their dreams into reality. Vaughn was the 2011 co-chair of the 56th annual Detroit NAACP Fight for Freedom Dinner, which annually draws 10,000 attendees. Vaughn is devoted to to family, enjoys traveling, reading, and attending sporting events, never missing a Detroit Lions home game. Oh, Barry Sanders, I remember those days. She is a member of Word of Faith International Christian Center in Metro Detroit. Vaughn is a member of the Distinguished Women in International Service, Gamma Phi Delta Sorority, and Top Ladies of Distinction. A Eureka Communities Fellow, Vaughn was a 2006 candidate for the Michigan State Senate. Vaughn is a sought-after public speaker, both nationally and internationally, and in the fall of 2014, she was chosen to speak at the World Islamic Economic Forum in Dubai on the rise of women entrepreneurs. Vaughn has inspired audiences of churches and civil rights organizations, major corporations and nonprofits, business leadership conference attendees, schools and universities, youth councils, women's groups, and more with her practical and unique insights on the advocacy, entrepreneurism, empowerment, diversity, and urban workforce development. Vaughn is the author of, and we talked about this a little bit earlier in the 7 o'clock hour, Ms. M.S. Goal, G-O-A-L, Digger. Success is Sexy, a CEO's guide to goal setting, dressing the part and having it all. This tell-all guide for today's businesswoman who wants to get what she wants for herself by herself. While the world may define success in dollars and cents, this book teaches women how to work smarter, not harder. She is also the co-author of the book Inspired Style. This guide to your glamour at any age features Vaughn and several other top image experts sharing tips to help women look and be their best. As a member of the Association of Image Consultants International, AICI, she has also contributed several articles on image, style, and business etiquette. A Detroit native, Vaughn earned a Bachelor of Science degree from Michigan State University and graduated from the Women's Campaign School at Yale University, sponsored by Yale Law School. Welcome to the Reading Circle microphone, Ms. Allison Vaughn. Allison, good morning. Good morning to you. Thank you so much for having me on. It's such a pleasure to be with you this morning. Well, like I said, I thank you so much for your flexibility and professionalism, because I know sometimes people get bent out of shape and they say, well, shape, and say, well I can't do it on that day. I'm not doing it at all. <laughs> oh, no, no. You know, like, I, like you mentioned, I totally understand things happen and things are not perfect. And, you know, you have to be flexible in life. So I'm, I'm totally flexible and understand the scheduling. So this morning it just happened to work out that I was available and Plus, you know, I've heard so many good things about you that I wanted to be on your show. So this is an honor for me to be on your show. Well, thank you. Actually, and, and the honor is always all mine in terms of, of the guests who appear on the show. So I'm, I'm grateful and thankful. That's an honor for you as well. Pam Perry, tell her hello because Pam, Pam introduces to me to some wonderful people. And she, you know, she'll contact me and say, do you have room or do you have a, a scheduled date or whatever? Because I have a great author, this, that, and the other. And so I always accommodate Pam and I have a few other people around the country who are like that. So I tell Pam hello and I'm glad you've heard good things. And, you know, I'm, I'm, it's, I, I've been, this is my 17th, this is my 16th going into 17th year on the air. And I have met over that time period some wonderful people from all walks of life. And the, oh, I can imagine. And six, what'd you say, 16 years? Yeah, this is the 16th season, and I'm, I'm actually heading into my 17th year. The show started in 2001, and I've been on the air since then. And over that time frame, I've met folks. When I say from all walks of life, I mean from all walks of life. I mean, I've, I've met the famous and the not so famous. <laughs> <laughs> the the pro- what an interesting job. It is, and this is not my this is not my day job. This is something I do for the most part as a hobby, but it's a part of my passion, which is reading and writing and public speaking and, and meeting people and talking and sharing information. Because for the listening audience, the hope is that not only is it entertainment, but it will be inspiration and motivation, uh, as well as 
education. And all of those are my passion. So I kind of like it all kind of comes together on Saturday mornings for me on the radio show. And again, I've met wonderful people such as yourself that become networking contacts and everything else. So with that being said, we'll go ahead and get started with the interview in terms of and I usually start from the time my guest is in high school or, or grade school or at least kind of get a feel for where did the writing and reading and all of that because I saw in your bio that reading is one of your passions. And I just told you that this is not necessarily my day job. My day job is principal of a school. I, I'm the principal of an elementary school with grades two to eight in an urban area. And mm -hmm. in many instances, to, to help kids really appreciate and understand the value of being able to read and read well becomes a challenge. So most of my guests who are authors, somewhere along their path, this whole passion for reading kicked in. And I always try to work folks into where that began up to the time of the writing of the book. So were you a reader as a child or did that come later in life or, or kind of what got you into the area of reading and writing and speaking, so forth and so on? I would probably say high school. Um, I was very active in high school. I was you know, like the junior and in my junior year in high school, I was vice president of the student council. Then my senior year, I was president of the student council. And then I was the high school homecoming queen. So I was very active in school. And one of the assignments was to do volunteer work and, you know, just be active and um, give back. And so I was just always reading. And I just thought by reading, you know, knowledge is power. I kind of learned that early on. And I think um, that helped me become very popular in school and, you know, friendly with everyone. So I just started doing that. And then in high school, when you're younger, it's known as a, a diary. So I kept right. a diary when I was, <laughs> you know, when you're young, it's a diary. And then when you become older, it's, it, the word is changed to a journal. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, so I've been journaling for a really long time. And so I've just... Every day I journal, and that was just my way of expressing my thoughts, and I guess that was my own version of self, self-help, self <laughs> just by journaling and, and expressing my thoughts. And so I always keep a, a journal by my bed at night, and then all these thoughts start coming together, and I said, well, I should write a book. Right. And um, I said, "What? wow, what a great idea. And then, you know, you get, everyone always said, oh, I should write a book. Well, right. So much has happened in my life, I should write a book about that. But nobody ever does. They always make that statement, but... I decided to actually do it, and I'm like, wow, this is great. So I guess to answer the question, when did it all start, I think I would have to say in high school is when the passion for writing really began. And see, I'm looking at your webpage, and it, I, I like the way you have that laid out, because the writing, the reading, the speaking, all that, it all fits into each one of your categories. You have the entrepreneur, you have the community advocate, you have the public speaker, and the writer. And the public speaking, writing, reading, all of that contributes to your being able to do that. And it's, so right. that's why I always kind of ask, kind of like, where did it start to help people understand that for some people, that's not just a, you know, snap decision or just, I just started doing it yesterday. This is something that I've kind of been doing all my life, not even realizing that I was going to wind up doing these things. I don't know, at that, when you were at the high school age or even college, front, did you realize you were going to be an entrepreneur, community advocate, public speaker, and writer? Not at all. Uh -huh. <laughs> I had no idea that I would go in that direction. Um, I graduated from Michigan State University with a Bachelor of Science, but I didn't think so much of being an entrepreneur. I thought I'm going to work for a large company and, you know, move up the corporate ladder. You know, I was thinking more of that career path. And then when I graduated from Michigan State in June, Two weeks later, I went to visit a college, um, one of my college roommates that lived in Los Angeles. I bought a round-trip ticket. I never used the return portion of the ticket. I loved, I got the sunshine bug, and I ended up moving out to Los Angeles. Wow. Uh, my mother was like, oh, my God, what's going on here? <laughs> and then um, while I was out there enjoying the sunshine and the bright lights and the glitz and the glamour of L.A., I saw... Um, a sign saying, or ad saying, United Airlines is hiring. And I got a job with United Airlines, became a flight attendant, and then I started traveling the world and enjoying meeting people and laying on the beach when I got to my destination. And I said, <laughs> oh, this is a lifestyle. 
this is the lifestyle. Here I am in Hawaii one week, and then the next week, you know, I'm in Hong Kong. I said, oh, my goodness. So, you know, when you're 20-some years old, this is like the life. Oh, yeah. So I was I was enjoying that. And then I ended up moving into management, moved to Chicago to United States you know, where the headquarters were. Right. I started hiring flight attendants, and so that's when I got into the human resource, the management, and I said, I really like this. But what happened, September 11th, remember the big tragedy of September 11th? Oh, I do. Everyone was afraid to fly. So United Airlines, they asked all the flight attendants and the pilots, they said, well, the country is afraid to fly. You know, our um, sales are down. Nobody wants to fly. If you, would you like to take a leave of absence? And so I volunteered to take a leave of absence, and that's when I started my um, business jackets for jobs. And, and I want to get into I, I, I want, the rest is kind of the rest is kind of history. And I really want to get into jackets for jobs because that is 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 a wonderful. Not only is it a job or or or. or or initiative, but the, the what the initiative does. Uh, so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about it because that's a wonderful concept. Like I said, I've, I, when I sent you the email or the text, I said, I don't know if you got my email because I think it had kicked back the last one I sent, or maybe it did because sometimes the service go crazy. But I had put in there, I've been following you on social media and you've been very busy because I've seen you like on Facebook, Instagram, and some of the other social media sites and I've seen you've been with all these people and all these different groups that you're talking and a lot of times you're talking about the uh, jackets for jobs about the nonprofit. so I want to talk about that right and I, wow now the, the the flight attendant piece I didn't know I saw all the other stuff about it but I didn't realize that until you just shared the story and I shared with you a couple <laughs> of minutes ago about the wonderful people that I've had an opportunity to meet over the years and it's always very intriguing and interesting for me to see the commonalities and mm -hmm. when I say that, it's because I am an aviation buff. When I say aviation enthusiast, really? oh boy, more than you know. I spent a lot of time on flight simulator. Uh, I, I, was, I did nine years in the Air National Guard as a jet engine mechanic. I used to work on fighter jets. I mean, I mean, one of my passions beyond the reading and writing and the principling and radio show is flying. And oh. so when you just said flight attendant, and, and the thing is, you look that part. If there's such a thing as looking a part, I'm looking at your pictures. And I could see that. I could see you being a flight attendant. And then each time oh, when you moved funny. up, and for, it, actually, it, interestingly enough, for, for each of your roles, you have the look for it. I mean, people say, like, you had the look, whatever that is. You know, you look like right, the president. Right. You look like the, the this, that. <laughs> like, what is that? What is the look? But obviously, there is something because that's what your right. book is partially about. <laughs> And so and you, you fit that. So when that time when I when I when Pam first introduced me to you and I looked you up on the internet, I said, oh, yeah, she definitely fits the title of her book and what it's all about and everything. So I want to talk about all of that. The time that we're together. If you've just joined us, we kicked off this interview at seven in the six o'clock hour. I did commentary on depression and mental illness. That's what we talked about this week. Last week in the 6 o'clock, I talked about President Trump, but this week we talked about mental illness. The two might go together. I don't know. But in any event, uh, <laughs> in 7 o'clock, my guest is Allison Vaughn. I'm going to share with you a little bit of information very quickly, like a 30-second to 60-second or time slot. During that time, you know the drill listening audience. Get on all of your social media sites, every last one of them that you're on, and let somebody know that Allison Vaughn is on the air with me. Around the world, they can catch me on Go Brave. That's G O B R A V E dot org. In the northern New Jersey area, you can catch me on FM radio, WP 88.7 FM. Do that while I share the information with you, and then we're going to go resume with our interview with Allison Vaughn. My name is Diamonds. I am a radio DJ in North Jersey. I broadcast on the frequency of 88.7 FM. I will be on the air every Saturday from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. when the sun is setting in the sky. If you are out there, if anyone is out there, I can provide music, I can provide entertainment. If there's anybody out there, anybody, please. Club Melting Pot. Every Saturday from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. 
only on WP 88.7 FM Brave New Radio. Dave, what are you doing? Just sending a gift to Dave2037. Who? Me in the future. I save a little money from every paycheck as a gift to Dave2037, so he can spend it on things like anti-gravity boots or a hologram Doberman. Something cool like that. I think Dave2037 deserves it. He worked hard. What are you getting Steve2037? I guess I was thinking Steve2037 would just fend for himself. Well, all right. But don't expect to be borrowing my anti-gravity boots. You want to have money in your future? You got to start saving now. Putting some money from every paycheck into a savings account or contributing to your 401k can make a big difference later. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free ideas and easy ways to save, go to feedthepig.org. That's feedthepig.org. Hey, let's just hope Steve2037 doesn't get his hands on a cold time machine because he is going to come back here and knock some sense into you. This message brought to you by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Ad Council. Having a place to go after school will make you a better student. Having an outlet to express yourself will make you a better artist. Having something to do together will make you a better family. At The Y, we're helping build better friends, listeners, writers, swimmers, scientists, and musicians one chance at a time. Get the gift of opportunity. Support The Y at YMCA.net. The Y for a better us. You're listening to The Reading Circle with Mark Medley on Brave New Radio. Yes, indeed, you are. You're listening to The Reading Circle with Mark Medley here on Brave New Radio and WP88.7 FM. My guest this morning is entrepreneur, community advocate, public speaker, writer, former airline flight attendant, Allison Vaughn. And we're working our way up to... Actually, Allison, you're the type of person when I have on the show that that does multiple things like that. I call them Renaissance people. So you're like a Renaissance <laughs> woman. <laughs> the experiences are vast, and that's a in in my eyes, that's a beautiful thing. Because I tell people all the time, life is so short to be pigeonholed into just one thing. Now, I'm not mad at people that that they can focus and do their entire life doing one thing. But for me, life should be adventurous. Like like I heard you tell the story, you bought the one-way ticket that I and stayed. Like, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I cannot believe I did that. And so it's like that kind of spirit, though, is what allows you to have these various roles. Right, it's, you're it, right. It takes that kind of spirit because there are some people like there's no way in the world I'd ever do that. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, they buy this round trip ticket and they're coming back, but nope, I did never use the return portion. And that was a big part of that was a turning point in my life because that spearheaded me to you know living outside of because you know I'm born and raised in Michigan, but having the opportunity to live somewhere else, experience a new job. You know, people. So right. yeah, that was a big turning point in my life. So as you now were, when we left off the story or the saga, you had <laughs> been, um, you had the opportunity to leave United. You had the option, which is again very similar because I had a similar option with AT and T and took it. That's how I wound up in education. And then, so you found it. Jackets for jobs. Let's while we're there, let's talk a little bit about that, and I'll work my way up to the book. Tell everybody what Jackets for Jobs is all about. Oh, sure. So Jackets for Jobs is a nonprofit organization where I provide employment etiquette, career skill training, as well as providing clothing to Detroit job seekers. And I shouldn't just say Detroit job seekers because we have an office in um, Botswana, but um, job seekers. So basically I'm into workforce development. And so the experience that I had from United Airlines working in human resource, I had that background so I basically help people look presentable when they go for a job interview. So we try to help them not only get a, jo- uh, get a job, but keep a job. So, you know, Detroit is one of the highest cities with unemployment, and a lot of times people just do not have the attire to wear. You know, there's so many barriers to employment, whether it's child care barriers, not having a sitter so they can go to work, transportation barriers, no transportation to get to a job, or clothing barriers, they just don't have anything up- presentable or to wear for a job interview, let alone to have a job. So there's so many different barriers. And so Jackets for Jobs is, exists to help that barrier of clothing um, when they're going for a job interview. Now, it's one thing not to have the means or the financial resources 
to to have the the clothing for the interview so forth and so on there's another thing not to have the the wherewithal or the sense to know that you should be dressed and where i'm going with this is something like dressing for success for an interview you would think would be a no-brainer and common knowledge but like i said i deal with people every day who something like that is not common knowledge and even if it is they still gonna try to do things their own way and, and my case in point is this we're constantly working with the kids about the picture with the teenagers and so forth make sure you pull your pants up don't wear your hat in the building don't do this don't wear ripped clothes don't this that and the other because one day you're going to go on a job interview and if you walk in that interview like that, you might as well know before you say your first word, the interview is over. So, oh, Mr. Medley, I wouldn't go to an interview like this. They say that, but nine times out of ten, they do. And then they wonder why they didn't get called for the job. So talk a little bit about the difference between, okay, it's one thing not to have the means. It's another thing not even to have the wherewithal to know that you ought to go to an interview presenting yourself a certain way. Right. When you mentioned that you would think it would be common knowledge to address professional for a job interview, it is not at all. Like they say, common sense is not common. <laughs> there are so many people that come to job interviews with, like you mentioned, like the saggy pants, or I've even seen young ladies um, dressed in house slippers, right. um, head rags for right. a job interview. And I'm like, are you serious? I mean, this is, I just, and just, a speechless to see that people would actually uh, show up at a job fair because I've worked so many job fairs and I really want to help our people. Like, come on, you know, here's a job opening. Right. You have to come correct, you know. And so that's why we help them, you know. Of the, we just, Jack's for Jobs just celebrated 17 years. And oh, congratulations. Assisted. Thank you. So I'm like you with the 16, 17 year milestone there. So um, people. We've assisted over 20,000 individuals with employment. Oh, God bless. The wonderful thing and the wonderful, the blessing with um, Jack is for Jobs is we have a partnership with TJ Maxx. And, you know, TJ Maxx is national. They right. have um, stores all over. And about 10 years ago, they called me out of the blue because they're headquartered in Framingham, Massachusetts, right outside of Boston, Massachusetts is where the TJX Corporation is located. But... The gentleman, the director of the community relations, called and said, Allison, I heard about your organization. We like the mission that you're doing. TJ Maxx is committed to working in the community where we have stores, and we're all about workforce development, and we would love to partner with you. And I was like, oh, wow, you know, this is interesting. So they said, we're going to fly in from Boston. Uh, we would love to meet you, take a look at your facility, and see if there's some synergy. And I said, Sure. They flew in. They said, we like what you do, and we've been partnering for 10 years. And so when we met, they did a $1 million investment. Wow. Jack is for jobs. And I was talking about this is such a blessing. Talk about a blessing out of the sky because I, I shopped at TJ Maxx. I'm familiar with them, but I had no idea that they did something like that. Right. So here we are celebrating 10 years of partnership. So when people come to Jack is for jobs, they're getting brand new things. Um, as if they would shop at TJ Maxx. So it's just great. No, it is. And to hear and listening audience, everyone, I don't care where you're listening in the world, if you're in the local area, what you heard Allison just say is the absolute gospel truth in terms of how folks show up to job fairs at my school, I have parents that will come in in the slippers, just like she said, the head rags, nightgowns, pajama pants. These are parents that are coming in to check on their child dressed like that, and then the child dresses the same way. That's what I was saying with the wherewithal, because they will do the exact same thing on a job interview and wonder why they didn't get the job. Matter of fact, all kinds of excuses will come up. I mean, and I, Allison, I'm very, very, I mean, I have, the older I've gotten, the less filter I have gotten. My filter is just all broken away. Uh, <laughs> I, whatever it is on my mind and heart, I say it. And I don't say it to be nasty. I say it in love. So I'm constantly telling because the community I serve is predominantly African-American and Hispanic. I said, look, let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to go in that job interview dressed like that or either not be able to speak or, or get your point across or what have you, and you're not going to get the job. Then when you don't get the job, you're going to be blaming it on the white man. Oh, well, you know, bruh. You know I would have gone, bruh, bruh, you know that they all for the white. No, you didn't do what you were supposed to do 
to compete. Exactly. So you need to get your education. You need to present yourself in a way that lets that company know I'm the person you're seeking. I'm the professional that you need. That's why that day when we had to, because my station management, they know. they like, oh, my God, we're going to have to hear from Mark. They know I'm big on professionalism. And so when you pull stunts like that where I have to call a guest an hour before the interview and then cancel it for something like that, that's not professional. So I'm big on professionalism. And so I try to instill that in my students and teachers and everybody else that when you deal with folks, you have to come across in a professional manner. And like we said a couple of minutes ago, you would think that's a no brainer. But it's not. So that's why a, a service or a company or a nonprofit organization like Jackets for Jobs is critical, especially in the urban area. Yes. So that is so true. Yes. So we're very big on teaching um, the men how to tie a tie. And interesting enough, you know, a lot of the homes are headed by um, mothers, women only. Correct. So a lot of the um, boys do not know how to tie a tie. Correct. So no male present in the home. So one of my favorite programs that we did was called A Tie to Remember, Teaching Young Boys How to Tie a Tie. So a lot of times they don't wear a tie or not professional just because they do not know how to. Correct. So um, that was a, a, a program that I'll always cherish because it was really, really valuable to these guys to teach them how to tie a tie. And then we also talk about etiquette and employment skills such as being on time and coming from the airline background Time is very important. And, yes, indeed. Um, a, you know, the stickler for time, you know, when the flight is going to leave at 6.52, it's going to leave at 6.52, not like, you know. And so I've just been brainwashed and programmed on being timely. And so I try to instill that in our job seekers as well. You have to show up on time for the job interview. If they tell you to be there at 9 o'clock, you need to be there at 8.30. That's right. So things of that nature are what we go over. And, ooh, I'm, I'm sitting here almost like in goosebumps because... Exactly what you're saying, folks, if you have children, if you have relatives, if you have anybody, this information that Allison is talking about, you got to share with folks. There are some people that really don't know. There are some that really don't know. They really are. And no one has taken the time to share the way. And whenever you were talking about the whole thing with the ties, we have done things like that in the various schools that I've served. But in my house, when I grew up as a kid, I had mother, father. We had the little Cosby family thing going on. I didn't realize just how different we were. I thought everybody had it like that, but they didn't. But when you just said that about the tie, immediately my mind went back to whenever I was a child. My father showed me how to tie a tie on the bedpost. Literally went in his bedroom, took a tie, and we just kept practicing on the bedpost. <laughs> That's how I learned how to tie a tie. I first learned how to tie a tie on the bedpost. Then I put it on myself and was able to turn it and dress. I wear a tie just about every day now, but that's not something every boy knows how to do because, as you said, so many of our homes are being headed by females. And that's not to say females don't know how to tie ties because they do. Matter of fact, for many of them, they learn how to do it because of their sons. But mm -hmm. it's something that you would think is common knowledge, but it's not. So when you have organizations that can intervene and offer these services, they are more critical than you know. And I heard you say something about etiquette. Oh, that's a big deal as well. Because it, is, it yeah. really more than people that oh that's just fluff. Oh, that's who cares which fork you use? Who cares whether you split your verbs or not? Who cares if you? They care. <laughs> yes, that is so that is so important, very, very important. And so that's what prompted me to write my books because I realized that etiquette is so important and when you have a business meeting and you're, you know, with clients, they're gonna notice, they're gonna look and see which fork you pick up. Yes. Say, okay, well she picked up the salad fork yes. or, you know, this or she used a dessert dessert fork and so they do notice little things and so etiquette is very important when you're conducting business and when you're out on a business meeting or you know just etiquette of just um, shaking hands and presenting your business card the right way so there's certain things that you just really need to know in the business world if you want to continue to succeed and go up and continue to network and meet with other people it really is and and, and again in terms of Thinking that people don't know, so you have no idea what people, when, especially in business setting and dinner or what have you, you have no idea how people are watching what you do. There's an old story, I don't know if it's true or not, my guess is it probably is, where there was a business meeting going on and the food was served and the person who was vying for the job or to be the client or whatever, before even tasting the food, immediately took salt and sprinkled it on there. And the fact oh, no. that the person did that, the other person who was the other side of the meeting made a decision then that they weren't going to hire that person. 
based on the fact that they put salt on without even tasting it. And they, and they use that as you prejudge before you even know the facts of the situation, you've made a move. I mean, and I'm saying that you I, never... I like that. I like that story that, because that, that is a good analogy. That's so true. You never know what signals people are using to make decisions. And that may be true. It may not be true. It may be just an old habit. I put salt on before. But someone now took that as your thinking or your thought process. So you just never thought, you know, like, like you just said, did you use the salad fork versus the, the entree fork? Did exactly, you, did right. you, you know, I mean, it's just things that in business. And then if you travel worldwide to different countries, you need to understand their culture. You need to understand what offends them. You need to understand what colors to wear and not wear. And in some countries, like in here, the United States, if a man sits down and, and puts his, le- uh, you know, crosses his leg up over his knee, it may not be offensive. You do that in another country, they're not supposed to see the sole or the heel of your shoe. I mean, it's just certain things, there's certain colors in countries. If you wear red in one country, you're going to offend the person. You just, and you need to do your research when you go to the country. It's the same thing here. But like I said, there's too many people who don't even, first off, they don't know they need to know. And secondly, even when they do need to know, they won't take the time to get to know it. That is so, that's correct. You're absolutely right. And that's why I love the foundation of and my beginnings of being a flight attendant and working in the airline industry because I, ha- I had that training, learning about different cultures because, you know, you're, when people travel, you're dealing with people from all over the world. Right. And so you do have to learn those things. So th- those examples that you use about not seeing the soles of a man's shoe or um, different colors represent different things in different countries, all of that is so true and it plays out um, in business. And so it's so important to know these things. So when you're traveling... It's a good idea to study up on, you know, where you're going and learn the different cultures and the customs of that particular country. No, it really does. And uh, my daughter, I know, is not listening because she would be she would be mortified and horrified and angry as heck that I'm sharing the story. But I'm going to share it anyway. We're sitting at the table all the time. And when she drinks her tea or, or hot chocolate or whatever, she's constantly doing the slurping sound with the spoon. I said, look, mm-hmm. you got to stop that. Because one day you're going to be in a business setting and that habit is going to be there. And they're going to be looking at you like you're crazy. Once the liquid cools off enough for you to put the cup up to your mouth and drink silently, do that. I'm sharing that story to say it's a matter of training. Because I was going back to some people don't know. But those of us who do know, we have to share and train. So I'm constantly challenging her. You've got to cut down on that sipping slurping sound just for the (laughs) sake of putting the spoon up to your mouth and sucking it off the spoon and all that. So so. They look at me like I have three heads, but I'm trying to tell them, look, I'm telling you what I know, that you're going to find yourself in a professional setting and you're going to do some of these little habits and it's going to cost you. So I'm saying all that again to say books like yours, organizations like yours who are working with folks, and I hate to keep saying our people, but who are working with African-Americans to, again, kind of equalize the playing field, if so to speak, because if you don't know, you don't know. But if you do know, then you got to do better. Right. Well, that's so if it makes your daughter feel any better, I do the same thing to my daughter. She does the same thing that's um, slurping, and I tell her the same thing. So I think it's just a parent thing, and we're just trying to guide them in the right direction because we want the best for them. That is absolutely, and that's, that's the message with all the kids. I, tr- I tell the kids at my school, look, I want no different from you than I want from my own biological kids. You know, I'm going to tell you the same thing I tell them because I truly do want to see them successful. I had a situation on Thursday. Uh, I had two emails that came to me back to back. One was we had done really well on a state visit that came to the school. So I was already thrilled about that. But the second email I got was from someone in the community who had seen the kids from my school at a Wendy's. And she, it, they, they were behaved so well that she took the time to email me to say, I just couldn't believe how well your students were behaving. And she was very sincere. She wasn't trying to be sarcastic or funny. But she said, I just wanted to let you know that the people sitting around me, we all noted the same thing. They were mannerable. They weren't pushing and playing in line, so forth and so on. And she said, when I asked them, what school do you go to? And they said, we go to Napier Academy, you know, ma'am. She, as a matter of fact, she even quoted what they said. They said, ma'am. And so, so that email made me feel so good because she said, I can tell somebody at the school, the teachers and the principal care and the parents, yada, yada, yada. But I say all that to say, we never know. People are always watching when we speak. Yes, that is so true. When we speak, people are always listening. At the college level, I teach public speaking. And one of the main things we work on is that um, putting um in between every other phrase or every other yes, sentence. Yes. 
we try to eradicate ums in my public speaking class. And I tell my students all the time in that class, and it's an old commercial, whether it's right or wrong, people judge you on how you speak. So public that speaking so true. public speaking has now become a required course in most colleges and universities. So everything that you're hitting on in your various organizations, they are critical to success, which leads me to the book. And I love a play on words because we know like in the relationship community or male, female or what have you, whatever. You always kind of get into this whole thing in a lot of movies so far about the gold digger, G-O-L-D. And gold digger does not necessarily have a positive connotation. Gold diggers for somebody, as you know, that pretty much is they're trying to get something for, you know, either they'll pretend to be your mate or either they're after you for your money or what have you. But in Allison's book, the title of it is Goal, G-O-A-L, Digger. Success is Sexy, a CEO's guide to goal setting, dressing the part, and having it all. Where did that come from? I mean, I know where it comes from now after the conversation, but talk to the audience about how it all came about. Thank you for that introduction earlier when you spelled it out, because like you said, it is a play on words. And when I tell people if they don't actually visually see the book, I do spell it out. It's Miss Goal, and I, G-O-A-L. And then they're like, oh, and then I said it's all about goals and um, networking and so forth. So thank you for spelling it out, because I do like for people to know. And it's interesting when you mention it's not gold, you know, Kanye West song, she, you know, what is right. it, she ain't a gold digger. Right. So I was listening to that song while I was writing the book. So I wanted to make sure that I listened to the lyrics so I can steer my audience, my readers, away from being a gold digger to being a gold digger. There you go. And so that was really interesting to listen to the song over and over again. And this book is really about setting goals, having a vision board, knowing how to network, having a millionaire mindset, and dressing the part. So it's, having, it's teaching women how to navigate through life to be successful. Because once you see your goals in front of you, if you have a vision board and you um, have that in front of you, you're more likely to achieve those goals. And so it's a really positive book. In the back of the book, at the last chapter, I have scriptures in there telling women um, how to pray, have prayers for success for your business, whatever your goals are. I have some motivational songs. I really, really love this book, and I've been getting such phenomenal feedback from it. And see, and I, I want to break this down piece by piece, and I'll tell you why. Because you just mentioned vision board. And I am a major, matter of fact, my home screen on my computer at, at home is a vision board. And I have right. vision boards. I've been working with vision boards for years it's part of what they call law of attraction to, exactly. you know, to a certain extent. But I need folks right. to understand law of attraction or vision boards does not take away faith and your belief in God. That does not cut across Christianity. It does not cut across religion. It does not cut across that. If anything, it's supported by the same laws. And so when you start saying vision board, there's many different ways. As a matter of fact, there's a site that you, there's many sites now. You can even do them online. You can create one online because uh, I'm on one of those sites as well. And like I said, on my home screen, on my desktop, is a vision board. And I've been doing this for years. As a matter of fact, the blotter on my desk in my school is a vision board. And a vision board, and I'll let Allison talk, and she can jo join in whenever you want, Allison, in terms of it's really about whatever it is that you want or your goal that you desire. You're cutting out pictures, literally, going in magazines, and, and, yes. and you're pasting them on, if like, you can get a big cardboard piece of cardboard, you literally, almost like a collage. Right. You paste it on there, what is, and, and I, can, I can attest and affirm that it works, because a car that I received, the car that I had before this one was a Nissan Xterra. And mm -hmm. I had put that Nissan, it was a 2000 Nissan Xterra. I put the picture of that Xterra in, on a vision board. And it happened to be the picture that I cut out was a red one, and I knew I wanted black. So mm -hmm. I already knew the color I wanted, and I knew now on the vision board I had put the Nissan Xterra. Sure enough, when I went, I was riding up the highway in the dealership. In the showroom was a black Nissan Xterra. 
that wow. black Nissan Xterra became my truck. That was my, that, it, 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 I, it, that's just one example. My wife, we were dating. It was funny. She walks up on my vision board at work, and I had something in there. And at that point, I had not been to Jamaica. And I had, it was a picture of in one of their ads about Jamaica, and it said, Exploring Jamaica. So she looks at that and she gives me the smile, looks at me and says, I can see you're doing that already because she's from Jamaica. <laughs> <laughs> so as it turns out, I wind up now because from that vision board, a wife from Jamaica, and I've gone to Jamaica two or three of them, I think, wound up having our wedding there. But again, that oh was on goodness. that was on the vision board. There's been other things that's on the vision board. So the fact that this radio show is here was on the vision board. Because right. what... Coupled with the vision board is the journaling. The mm -hmm. journaling you were talking about and the vision board, those two things work together, and it's all part of the goals. So I wanted you, I said all that, and I probably gave you the answer that you were going to give. I said all that to say, talk about the vision board, connect it to how it works with goals, and then work your way to what we kind of talked about with dressing. Yeah, that vision board is amazing. I mean, when you like get a cardboard, and some pictures, you just sit down one afternoon. If it's a rainy day and you have nothing to do, just get a, a lot of magazines, newspapers, whatever you can, and pen, paper, some scissors, and just start cutting out visions of things that you would like to achieve. Right. Something as simple as, um, let's just say, if you want to lose 10 pounds. I've even done this. I've never been, like, overweight. But I, you know, every woman, even men want to lose weight, you know, make sure that their body is together. Right. And I've cut out a picture of a smaller body and a picture of my head. Say, okay, well, this is the size that I want to be. That's right. I, and then I've done the car thing. I've cut out a picture of a car. I cut out a picture of um, some water for vacation. It was a nice, um, I think it might have been a picture of Hawaii, the, the ocean or something. And whatever it is, and, and I just put things or... If you want to have more money in the bank account, you just cut out some dollar signs or something. And you just put this on a board. Correct. And you have this board where it's visible, where you can see it daily. Correct. And then you look at it, and it's, it's something, like you said, the law of attraction. And those things, end up ma you end up manifesting. These things really happen. And so you just have your faith, whatever your faith is, and whatever religion, but you just have your faith, your energy, and you visualize that, and those things really happen. And so I'm a big person i really believe in having a vision board and that's one of the chapters in the book miss gold digger because when you have a, a vision and you see that in front of you you're more likely to achieve your goals absolutely you write down and then i also am a list person every day i have a list of things to do and once i write down i need to go to the grocery store i need to um, have a meeting i need to do this i need to do that and i write all the things that i need to accomplish that day and then once you accomplish that thing, you cross it off, and it's a sense of accomplishment. That's right. Okay, I accomplished this. I accomplished that. Wow, I had 10 things on my list today, and I did 7 out of 10, so that was a good thing. And then the next day, I transfer those three things to the next day. And so it gives you purpose. It makes you feel like you're accomplishing something. It makes you feel successful, like, wow, I had a goal, and I achieved it today. Now I can do the next thing tomorrow. So I, I believe in writing a list. I believe in journaling. So as you can see, a pen and a paper is very important to me. Yes, indeed. Yes, and, and, and the things that Allison is talking about, listening audience, again, I can affirm and attest to. It Biblically, it says, with lack of vision, and I'm paraphrasing, people perish. If That's you right. don't have a vision, you'll perish. And if you don't have a vision anywhere, you'll wind up. You can wander aimlessly without a goal or a vision and God gave us senses for a reason and one of them is the ability to see and it's something about seeing things on paper or on a board in front of you that attracts those things to you now it doesn't happen I don't want anyone leaving here thinking it's gonna happen the next day I don't want anybody okay. leaving here thinking it's gonna happen in the next week or in the next minute and in some cases it might but in general it might be something that you have in front of you on a daily basis that might happen a year later it may manifest six months later, but it comes. 
And that's why I'm saying I I know it works because it has worked in so many instances for me. That whole list thing, I I have a big whiteboard that stands in front of me at my office. And each day as I come in, I take the dry erase mark and I write down what I intend to get done over the next couple of days. And I do the same thing. Check them off once they're done. It is something about that feeling of accomplishments. And you said it earlier when you were talking about it came to my mind whenever you were talking about the whole partnership with TJ Maxx. That's what you said, right? TJ Maxx? Mm -hmm. When TJ right, Maxx, Max, yes. when TJ Maxx came to you, what came to my mind was that manifested because of you attracted that. Whether it was on a vision board, a list, or the, just the fact that you were doing the jackets for jobs, and what that organization was about attracted TJ Maxx, which was a part of the whole vision to begin with. And you were like, "Why?" It seemed like they dropped out of the sky. They did what they right. did. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's right. So it was. It's all about that vision board. It's all about writing goals and. I saw a quote that I absolutely love, and it says, if you don't achieve your goals, if you don't set goals and achieve your goals, you'll work for somebody else that does. Correct. And so I I think that's so true. If you do not have your own goals, you'll end up working for someone that does. And it it is true. And and truth be told, I mean, I get the goal thing, and it's a part of planning. Now, I know every year for the school, we have to sit down and we have to write goals for the next year. I hate the process. But mm-hmm. once they are set, we usually have to do four because they tell you, you know, don't try to do too many at one time. So they kind of capped us and said, I need you to do four goals, pick four different areas. We usually do a language arts, a math. Um, we do something that we call climate and culture. And then we do a fourth goal, which is which is academic instruction, which is instruction overall. So we have to set goals in those areas. But I will say as arduous and as grueling as the process of getting together what the goal is going to be, once we now have that and we're going through the year, we know exactly what we're looking for. We know exactly uh, where we're trying to reach. We may not know exactly how we're going to get there and every little step we're going to take, even though we have to write out a bunch of action steps. But at least we have a direction. And it's interesting. Right, we have a direction. That's right. And interestingly enough, that since you were in the aviation industry, you know, probably just like I do, that 90 to 95 percent of the time, the plane, for the most part, is off course. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, it reaches its destination. Right. So, yeah, it's so true. even though it doesn't necessarily fly like a straight line pattern, it knows the end goal mm-hmm. and it gets right. there. It's the same thing with goal setting. And the fact, I like I cracked up when I saw success is sexy, and immediately what came to mind and there is again working with kids. I have a, a little bit different frame of mind. Allison, you would be amazed how many kids dumb themselves down because they don't think it's cool to be smart. So the fact uh, that, that I see yes, that you that, ha- that is so disappointing. It I, is. I hate for the kids to dumb me down and not think that's cool. Because, you know, being smart, and we just have to try to program it, these, the kids to let them know being smart is, and that's why the title, the little subtitle, Success is Sexy. Yes. Because basically what I'm saying is, if you're smart, if you're skilled and confident, that's, that's sexy. And that's what I'm talking about. So when I say sexy, I'm not talking the mini skirts and the stuff. Right. Now, again, a person, play on words. Successful. Right, exactly, a play on words. For me, everyone defines success in different ways. But however you define success, I'm talking in the terms of being skilled and confident in what you do. Absolutely right. So, again, each time when I saw a piece of your title, something else came to mind. And that's when I saw that part. I said, man, I got kids that honestly, I mean, you're talking straight A students that will intentionally flub the test or play stupid because they don't want their kids. They don't want their little classmates to call them nerd, geek, bookworm, this, that, and the other. I, I laugh because I have four daughters, four girls. Could not buy a boy. Oh, you're in a house with four girls. Four oh, my girls, and, and three of them are, for the most part, grown now. But I, every you talking about earlier about people say, you know, everybody has a book in them. I always tell my girls, you know, one day I'm gonna write a book that says I want my daughter to have the nerd. I, you know, <laughs> I, I want my daughter to have the bookworm. I want it because this is what has happened. When I was in high school, the finest girls in there, they had, they didn't want to have nothing to do because I was the nerdy little bookworm, studious guy. And they always wanted the bad boy, the one who could fight and rode motorcycles, the, you know, in happy days, the Fonzie type guy. Uh, that's who they wanted at that time. And then, and, 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 you know, so all of us little nerdy guys was kind of like, well, you know, they don't give us the time of day. But now 15, 20 years later at class reunions, when now all the nerdy guys are successful, 
all these same mm-hmm. girls are kind of like, ooh, if I had known. Ah. Exactly. Yeah, they're like, <laughs> oh, wow. Look at him now. He's right. successful. What was I thinking back in high school? Uh, right. And <laughs> and so that, I'm saying all that to say that, yes, being smart is cool. Being successful is sexy. Being successful is cool. And it doesn't just come just because you want it. There's certain things you have to do. And that's what Allison's book is all about. She's giving you the guide. She's giving you instructions on what to do. And we've been talking about it all the way up the path, all the way up the line. How to dress for your job interview, how to speak, how do you know the etiquette in terms of even as simple as what fork do I use in the restaurant? Where do I place my napkin? What do I say? This and the other. Then, the, you know, the dressing, the fact that you're setting go, all of it connects, connect the dots. And that's what Allison is doing for you in her book, Ms. Gold Digger. Because you notice, and I, as a language arts teacher, I hang on every word. I noticed you didn't put Miss, M-I-S-S, and you didn't put Mrs., M-R-S. You put Ms., I'm assuming that was intentional also. Yes, that was very intentional. And I want to make sure that your readers know where to get the book. And I want them to know that they can go to Amazon.com to get the book, or they can go to my website, AllisonVaughn.com, um, to get the book. And then the book is available um, in paperback as well as on Kindle. Well, I'm definitely going to get the Kindle version. Now, I'm not a woman, but I'm going to read it anyway. <laughs> well, you have you mentioned you have four daughters, so yes. I'm not sure of the age range, but I'm sure it will be a nice gift for your daughters, or your if you have nieces, it will be a great book. So uh, You're I, right. Yeah. I, I have four daughters and two nieces. I'm telling you, you couldn't buy a boy. <laughs> four daughters, <laughs> two nieces. They range, my daughters range from 27 to 16, and so it's oh, one, yes. 127, 122, 121, 116. And so they, they range in those days. And then I have two nieces who are in their early 20s. So, yes, I mean, and, and, and again, we're trying to help you connect the dots. And, and I'm glad you said that in terms of availability, because when we get to the end of the interview, I shut up all together. I just turn the mic off and I give you the opportunity to promote. <laughs> and you get the opportunity to promote and you can say anything with the exception of the dollar amount. But in terms of book signings, how they can get a hold of you, websites, all that kind of stuff, I give you the opportunity to do that. So we're going to reiterate that once again before we're done. But... The second piece, the trick to this, is getting the book in the hands of people and then getting them to read it and getting them to follow the instructions. If we, will, if we can get that from folks listening to this interview, we will have done much. Because, as I said, stuff that we think is a no-brainer really is not a no-brainer. As, as Allison said earlier, you know, common sense is really not that common. And in, in some respects, that's why her organizations can exist, because if it ever gets to the point where everybody knows it, then she's going to have to shift her focus again. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I like what you were saying about, you know, leading them to it's almost like that statement. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Correct. So, you know, you can give a person a book, but will they open the book? Right. So my goal is that people that buy the book will read the book and they just won't put it in their book you know, on the shelf. So, so far, so good. People are reading the book and they're responding and they enjoy the, ch- the different chapters and I'm getting great feedback from it. But it's, it's some really good information, which is very helpful and things that you do not think about. And one of my favorite chapters is networking. Right. I think it's very important to network. You know, if you want to succeed in business, you have to network. You can't be a wallflower, yes. you know, and just... Go, go to an event and just stand in the corner or just go and eat the hors d'oeuvres and say, okay, I, I attended that function. You have to be able to network. You know, you have to open up and not be shy. I know speaking in public is, you know, that's, what is that, the number one fear of most yes. people. But you don't have to speak at a seminar full of 500 people, but you do need to know to, you know, go to a networking event and socialize. And so I have a lot of great tips on socializing and opening up. Absolutely. I laughed when you said, you mean the Oodovers? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> uh, uh, That's and you funny. said hors d'oeuvres. See, again, but this is all about, you can't walk up in the restaurant, look at the menu and said, I want the Oodovers. This is what, these are the kind of things we're talking about, folks. It could be the difference between that you getting. So <laughs> I t- like I said, I t- you were, your your statistic about public speaking is correct, and that's generally when I teach the public speaking course. That's how I open. It. I said, "Do you understand that people, literally, not figuratively speaking, but literally, would rather die 
that to get up here and speak in front of other people. Now, for me, I could be in Detroit Lions Stadium. I could be in Yankee Stadium. I can be I can be in a stadium full of people. You give me the microphone. I'm there. For other You're people, there. right. For other people, if you said they have to talk to two people, they were like, oh, my God, I'd rather die. Like, but. If you are going to get ahead, you are going to have to be able to do it. So I, as a public speaker, do you get, and I'm sure you do because I see it in your bio, you get a chance to talk to schools and youth groups and, and so forth and so on. How do the girls oh, or the kids take it? Oh, I love speaking in public. I've um, been speaking in public um, since high school, and I've been the commencement I've keynote speaker at events and the commencement speaker. I enjoy it. I don't know why that has for me, it has not been a fear. I mean, you always get a little nervous. I don't. I you're supposed to. Who you are, you just get a little nervous. You're supposed to. I don't have a fear of that. You're supposed to. Now that's that's another part of the course. You're suppo- every speaker, and I'm good at it. And I, I don't have a problem with saying I'm good at it. But every speech I give, I have butterflies, and you right. should have butterflies in the beginning. But they should dissipate once you've launched into your talk. There are some people, the butterflies never leave, and you can visibly see them shaking. <laughs> That's oh, what yeah, they're just standing there shaking. Yes. Like, oh, no, I just do not want to do this. But. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, then, no, I, no, I don't care how great you are. The, the little bit of butterflies and nerves prior to the speech should be there. Because you know what? That's a sign of that you're not cocky. Because it's been mm-hmm. it's been my experience when I walk into something like that and I, oh I got this I'm gonna knock them dead I'm, that's when stuff mess up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that that's true. Yeah, so I guess that, that's that's a good point. Yeah, it's, you're not cocky about it. You're just just a little nervous. And right. I think the secret to it, well, what someone told me, and you can validate and, and let me know if this is true, is before you do a presentation, before you speak, talk to your audience. So if you're able to, you have a few minutes beforehand. Yes. You walk around, talk, get a couple of names and. You can kind of insert those names in your speech yes. or say something, but, you know, just talk and get a feel for your audience. So that's very important to get a feel for your audience before you talk. That way you know exactly who you're talking to and have a feel, and then you can make them a little at ease a little bit more. And then you have that one-on-one rapport, but it's not really a one-on-one rapport, but it's a group rapport, but... No, you're absolutely right. If you if you if you go to any public general, especially like a Toastmasters, they give you the ten things. Somewhere in that list, very close to the top, is know your audience. Mm-hmm. When you're preparing for your topic, know who your audience is going to be, and what you just said is more important than you know. If you get there early and you get a chance to chat with people prior to your speech. You, if, if there's a break and there's lunch or something, it's a, if it's a, it's a workshop and you get a chance to sit at the table with some people in the audience or after this week, you would not know what that does for the person that you've now been in their presence and what it does for you. Because That's it's right. it's kind of like this whole 15 minute fame thing. If you're a public, first off, if you're a public speaker, people automatically look up to you because we just said it's something that people think they would rather die than do so for people who can do it people who don't want to do it or can't do it look up to you so now the fact that you're the speaker and you've taken time to talk to them oh that blows their mind <laughs> you say whoa that's right yes and then when if you if you're able to incorporate either something they've said done or their name into your speech and it's so funny that you're saying that because I just taught a class um, this you know a six week class not long ago and I shared that same tip with them Pick up, if speakers come before you, try to work something in that they said into your presentation. Try to reference them. Try to reference them or what they said. Or something. So they're all little tips, again, but you have to pick up the book. You have to read. You have to study it. There are things that people don't really realize, but they make the biggest difference in the world. And I'm going to say again, that's why books like yours are so important. That's right. That's right. They need to get this book. All right. Well, I tell you what, we have come down to about the end of our time together. And I, like I said, I'm going to shut the microphone off. And I agree with you. I'm going to download the book today. It is wonderful. It is Ms. M.S. period. Goal. G.O.A.L. Because I want to. And, and by the way, I'm not a Kanye fan, but I do like that song. Uh, that, that's the one with with Jamie Fox in there, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Now, like I said, I'm not Kanye. Is I, I mean, I could do a show on my thoughts on him, just like I did last week on the president. But that song, I really do like. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, it's a catchy song. It, and, it really it, is. Good. <laughs> but Allison's book is Goal G O A L 
Digger, D I G G E R. Success is sexy. A CEO's guide to goal setting. That's chief executive officer. That's what you are. You're a CEO. Guide to goal That's setting. Right. Dressing the part. I have a. I'm on this tear because there's just some things that Allison just don't make sense to me. I get fashion design. I get fad. I get style. But for the life of me, and my father died like 30 years ago. I know he wouldn't have been able to take it. But you, we have folks who actually now go in stores and they purchase a pair of jeans that's already torn. They're already ripped up, torn up, shredded, what have you. And where that, I don't know where the style came from, but, and I know some designers probably getting rich of it, but it makes no sense to me only because, especially as an African American, by the time our clothes started looking like that, it was because we'd probably worked ourselves silly or we didn't have anything else to put on. So we had to wear it every day. So that it started getting ripped over time. And now we go into the store and spend top dollar over clothing that's ripped. So I have for the most part banned ripped jeans in my school. Constantly on the kids, isn't it? Oh. And again, because for many of them, they will walk up in that interview with ripped jeans on. Mm-hmm. And so I really kind of shot. I was like, I don't, if you wear that for your play clothes, you wear that when you go home, I don't care. That's on you. But during the school day, because of the image we're trying to uphold, we're not going to allow ripped jeans here. Uh, but I say all that to say. I'm glad to hear, hear you say that. Oh, in my building, boys can't wear caps. No, no white T-shirts and all that kind of stuff, um, which, again, back to this whole dressing the part. That's what we're trying. Even though they're second through eighth grade, I'm trying to get their minds now. Oh, yeah, that's the age where you have to start right then and there. Good for you. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you have that um, dress code. Oh, yes. I mean, they get, oh, the men come on my belly and get an attitude with me. And like, Sir, you got to take your hat off. <laughs> we, our, our, we're, we're teaching our boys that in a building like this, you don't wear your cap on while you're in here doing business. When you come in the building, you take it off, and when you go back out, you can put it back on. Oh, I get all kinds of attitude. It's like, but I, said, I, said, I tell you what, go down to Washington, D.C., to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, and try to keep that hat on. Take, go to a ball game, and, and when it's time to sing the Star Spangled Banner or salute the flag, try to keep the hat on. Go, go to a fancy restaurant and sit in there with the cap on and see. <laughs> That's right. So, so we, 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 we really do push that. I mean, I, I had somebody tell me two days ago they wanted to take the kids to a trip to New York on Broadway, and somebody told them they wouldn't be able to do it because the kids wouldn't be able to behave. I said, yes, they will. Yes, 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 they would. I mean, because every time I do a production in my auditorium at the school, I tell them, you're practicing for Broadway. Good. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I see, again, but if you don't know, you don't know. But if you have somebody who's trying to teach you or somebody to help you, then take advantage of it. And I'm going to keep relating it back to your book. That's exactly what you're doing with your organizations and your books. You're providing a resource. You're providing the help. It is up to the person that's receiving it to take advantage of it. That's right. So with that said... This is your opportunity to promote. I am not going to say a word. I won't interrupt you. I'm going to put the mic button on off. You have the opportunity to promote anybody that wants. If you, if you are in the New Jersey area, I'd have you as our commencement speaker this year. Uh, no. but, but, I, <laughs> but let folks know how they can get a hold of you, how they can get the book, the websites, Kindle, everything. This is your chance. Well, thank you, Mark. I, I, I really enjoyed talking with you. This has been such a wonderful conversation, really, really enlightening, and I hope all of your listeners have enjoyed listening to our conversation. So if anyone is interested in learning more about me, please visit me on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, as well as uh, Facebook. Getting my book, you can get that book on Kindle, hardback, uh, on paperback, Amazon.com. And I think that's an easy plug. I think I've done it. Just yeah, it Amazon.com, is. AllisonVaughn.com. And she's Allison with one L. I'm, I'm big on that's words correct. and spelling. Well, that's she, A-L-I-S-O-N. And my last name is Vaughn, V as in Victor, A-U-G-H-N, AllisonVaughn.com. And if you go to her site, you will see she lives what she's preaching. You will see all of those photos. And my guess is that's probably how you dress on a daily basis. That's it, yes. That's what I thought. <laughs> just just an <laughs> assumption. Just an assumption that the hair, that's the a pearls. Good that's correct. <laughs> yep. The pearls, the hair, the suits. One of my vice principals, boy, she wears a mean suit. I told her, I said, whew, he said, you wear a mean suit. She said, that's the way I've always been. But again, it's the image, the projection. It's all connected. 
And we're not talking about being phony. We're not talking about being insincere. We're not talking about any of that. But people know a professional person when they're in their presence by how they're dressed, how they carry themselves, how they speak, so forth and so on. So if you go to Allison's website, you will see that the very thing she's trying to teach you to do, she's doing. She's not just telling you what she thinks. She's telling you what she knows. And if you look under each picture, you will see, like she said, you follow on her social media sites, you will see. And there's no reason why you can't do the same thing to some degree. You may not be able to rock it like Allison is rocking it, but you can rock it. Oh, isn't that you? <laughs> so so that, that's the point. You can, I mean, Everybody can do something rather than walking up on the interview with the cap turned backwards or the white T-shirt or the ripped jeans or the sneakers and then wondering why you didn't get hired. <laughs> or as I was teasing yeah. a couple of minutes ago, picking up the menu and saying Oodovers. So like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I found that to be so funny. No, it is, it is funny. It is meant to be funny. It's a joke. I mean, after I saw it on a comedy, an old comedy at that, uh, The Honeymooners. And Ralph Cramden, mm-hmm. that's what he, he looks at, yes. the, at the interview and he calls them Oodovers. So I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it's funny but it, it's sad but can be true and that's what we're it, trying it's to true. avoid I think that's why I'm laughing because it's sad and true uh-huh. that's what we're trying to avoid well Allison again I thank you for your flexibility I thank you for rising to join me early because you're up there in Motown very famous city on a music, for those of us who are musicians and music lovers we know Motown Barry Gordy and all the acts that came out of there yeah. And then recently up there in the Flint area, we were heard about the water and everything else. So, and then the Detroit Lions, the last few years, they've, their record has been progressing. And, you know, I'm a, you mentioned in my, in my bio, I'm a Detroit Lions season ticket holder, and I'm a true blue. I'm not a Fairweather fan, so I, I love my right. Lions. I know that's right. That's the way I am with the Pittsburgh Steelers. I don't care if they don't win a game. I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. <laughs> yes, could, they, yes, you have to be a true fan. Yes. So, all right. Well, again, I thank you. I'm gonna, I'll contact Pam or the next time you talk to Pam, tell her we definitely got together, and I'll email her and let her know. And uh, you know, my guests always have an open invite. As long as I'm on the air, you're free to come back. If you have new work or another book or whatever you want to discuss, it's just a matter of an email. Wonderful. Well, I definitely would keep you um, in mind for that because I've really enjoyed our conversation. Good. Same here. And I do record them. And once I'm done editing it and boiling it down, everything I do, I will send you the link and you can use it any way you want. Perfect. Great. Okay. All right. Have well, a- you enjoy this day. Thank you. You do the same. Have a wonderfully blessed day as well. And we'll be in touch. Thank you, Mark. All right. Take care. That ends another edition of The Reading Circle with your host, Mark Medley. And that was Allison Vaughn. And as I said, she walks her talk. If you look at her website, you look at her pictures, you'll see. And I don't think those were just pictures that were like staged. I think (laughs) just talking to Allison, I think that's the way Allison looks and is most, if not all the time. Maybe whenever, you know, she gets ready to go to bed, she ties up the hair and all that kind of stuff. But I think during the day... The Allison that you see on her website is probably the Allison you run into all the time. And so she has a book that can show you how to get there. Why not take advantage of it?